everyone, and welcome. My name is Mike McMahon, and I am the Executive Director of the Hymn Society of the United States and Canada. And I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Jorge Lockwood, and I'm sure you're going to be delighted as well. It's nice to see so many of you here. I want to give a special shout out to Nancy Faust. I see you on online here, and I'm just so pleased that you're able to join us today. I've been trying to call you, so <laughs> hopefully we'll have a chance to talk sometime soon. Well, um, many of you, of course, already know Jorge, but he is uh, the uh, Minister of Worship Arts at the Church of the Village in New York City, and he also is a worship consultant for the Methodist Theological School in Ohio. Um, he, for a long time, he was a director of the Global Praise Program at the General Board of Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church and edited a lot of resources on global music and worship. Um, he's He's a great leader. I mean, he not only talks about the stuff, he not only writes about the stuff, but he knows how to um, engage people to sing and to put their hearts and souls into the praise of God. So I am just so happy to have the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. Jorge, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Likewise, it's good to be here. And it's good to see the names that are popping up in the chat. Uh, yeah. Every name comes with a lot of amazing powerful memories so I'm, I'm already blessed lots of stories and we're blessed to have you today um i, I wonder if you would, wouldn't mind starting at the beginning and talk a little bit about your background and um your growing up and um how you came to um you know be attracted to music and and worship and church hmm. the music part it's it's a little bit um new agey you know because um and there was one time that for some reason I was confined to my room, either either as a as a chastisement or because I was sick. I don't remember well. Um, but um, they my, my parents gave me a, a, a radio that so that I would you know listen to stuff. And I hit a classical station, a classical music station in the Dominican Republic, um, and. I heard two things um, that I then recorded on a tape. Um, and one was um, Faust, actually, Gunnar's Faust. And I remember the, um, you know, the Golden Calf um, aria. And I thought it was actually the devil itself. Like, uh, so that gave me an idea of the power that music has, you know. Um, but then there was um, another, you know, I did say that I was going to connect my computer. And I did connect it to power, but forgot to connect the power to the computer. Let me do that now. There we go. Um, but then there was another one, which was um, Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto. Um, and I would listen to it every single day um, for some reason, just the first movement. I, and then one day, like maybe a year after that, my father comes to me um, with tears in his eyes. And he says, you know, I love that you love music. Um, and but I need to let you know that your mother um, listened to that particular piece of music, the Tchaikovsky Rolin Concerto, every day when she was pregnant of you. Huh. And my mother died when I was 11 months old. So and it was a great loss for my father. So it was a you know, sweet and sour moment for him. But this is where I where I started to understand the power that music has um, in, in the imagination and in, in our bodies. Um, but in terms of church music, um, I grew up in the Plymouth Brethren tradition uh, on one side from my father's side. And then my grandfather was a big lay Methodist leader. Um, my father thought that the Methodists were too, too liberal. So he <laughs> became, you know, Plymouth. So, but I love it because I got the best, I think, of both, of both um, traditions and, and understandings. Um, so there was a missionary from Canada uh, who's passed away now. Her name... Um, I'm going to say is because she she lives in God, uh, Joanna Kent. And Joanna played the piano for our congregation. Um, but she noticed that I had an interest. I was kind of self-taught in, in the piano. I saw my mother playing and then I just kind of figured things out, not by ear, interestingly, but I started like reading music. So she gave me a, a piece of music. <laughs> I will never forget it. Um, it's it's a translation of you know the Bible is like a um, hammer that cuts the rocks into two. It's, it's a children's song, you know, about the Bible. And she said, you know, learn this. She gave me many months to learn it for the children's choir was going to sing it. And then the day came, and the children's choir 
um, ended the song and I was like, I still had two measures to go. So I was completely off, you know, out of sync with them. But Joanna came to me with a huge beaming smile and said, this was amazing. Here's your next piece. So I, I, it, she's a model for me. Uh, as I mentor, mentor others that the whole idea is not doing it. Nobody does it well at the beginning. You know, you, you're supposed to not do it well. Um, but your mentors, your guides, um, your role models are meant to provide a, an, an encouragement. In a way, him society is like that for me as a whole. Meaning when I think of myself, when I started at him society, some of the things that I understood, believed, and where I am now, it gives me, it fills me with um, gratitude, embarrassment a little bit sometimes, and a lot of humility. Meaning, if that is the case, then I have to assume that there's something right now that I that I need to learn that I still don't know. So it puts me in that posture. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you like one one last story about yeah. growing up with music. This is the the, the foundational Jorge story about ministry. <laughs> um, so you know, years pass. Joanna leaves on um, on furlough. You know, she's a missionary, so she's going on furlough. Um, and so I become the pianist of the church for a whole year. And when she comes back, she says, "Oh, I'm not playing anymore. You're it." You know. So I became the pianist of this church, uh, Sala Evangelica, in the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo. But one day, or and one day, um, around, I would say, 4.30, I was taking a nap uh, Sunday afternoon. Now, the communion service is a very important service in the Plymouth Brethren tradition. And it's one that doesn't have a formal leader, but where people, males, to be, to be fully honest, um, maybe that has changed, but at that time it was males, would call forth hymns. It says, let's sing hymns you know, 254, and can it be that I should gain? Um, so in Spanish, of course. Um, and then I would play the introduction and we would sing the hymn. And then once in a while, there'll be somebody who reads the scripture. And when the right time comes, one of the elders of the church would read from 1 Corinthians because I received from the Lord what have I passed on to you, that Jesus, you know, and, you know, the whole Eucharistic text in, in Corinthians. And that would be the signal then that we're about to have communion. So I'm having a nap. Church is at six. I have to get up because it's 4.30 to get ready. But I don't want to. <laughs> I am just so, I'm enjoying my nap so much. So I'm like in that state between dreaming and being awake. And it was delicious. Um, but I knew I had to go. But I, I was like refusing to go. <laughs> so I fall into another kind of sleep. And I have this vision or dream that changed my life. I started seeing people leaving the church i saw like like two two screens and when one people were leaving the church after a communion service and their like their, their faces were lit up with the spirit and then the other one their faces were nice but not lit up with the spirit and somehow i got the understanding that my attitude as a leader was what made the difference between one picture and the other that if i could create because I was in it already, a place for spirit. So the ethical um, weight of, of playing the piano in a service where the piano is really the leader, because there's nobody like leading the music. It's like, I, I am more of a pastor in that service than any pastor or elder. What I do matters incredibly, and thus I am responsible for it. And that accompanies me to this day. Um, mm. That's how that's my approach to ministry. I have a saying that I do ministry in pampers, meaning you know, like I'm like, oh my God, here we go, <laughs> you know, because because it's a big responsibility. You know, the the songs that we choose and the way that we lead them can lead to life or lead to death. Um, so right. anyway, those are those are a few stories. Those are great. But uh, uh, did you did you have other mentors along the way as you uh, uh, as you developed uh, any significant ones that you? Uh... Yes, I, I love to mention. Um, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna have to limit. I'm gonna limit myself to four. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> because they're uh, many. They're many. So I think um, the first one I'm gonna name is Reverend Pedro Pablo Piron. He's the a Methodist pastor um, in in New York City who received me when I came to New York. 
and who had a dogged belief in me beyond what I even believe about myself right now. Uh, he, he, there was only one time that he got angry with me, which was when I, I started taking like way too many invitations from churches to do things. <laughs> and he looked at me, he was, you know, firing his eyes and he says, like, God didn't call you to play your little guitar in every little place. You were called to bigger things. I mean, I don't play the guitar, by the way, but he was just trying to, it was a metaphor of like, choose what you do, you know, think big, benefit as many people as you can. Um, and don't be beholden by the thought that because you can do something, you must do something um, that you have to choose. Um, and through him, um, I became part of the editorial committee for Mil Voces para Celebrar, the, the Spanish um, United Methodist Hymnal, which then opened the door to meet Michael Hahn, which is another person who was very significant in my life because Michael then invited me to come to, to Perkins and that opened yet many other doors. And then from there, I met Esti Kimbrough, um, who then hired me to work with him on Global Praise and then passed on the mantle to me. And with Esti, oh my God, I mean, I could not stop naming the lessons and the opportunities that came from one person sort of believing, believing in me in that way. Um, at a time again, that maybe I didn't believe so much in myself. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, um, these are some of the men, and I just realized I've all, only named all of, all, I guess I named Joanna as my main mentor. So there's this one powerful female figure, there's many others in there, but I need to also mention Pablo, Pablo Sosa. So um, Pablo's topic is a little bit emotional for me um, for many reasons, but I, when I lead, I can see him, meaning there's a lot of things that I do that are directly from his DNA. Um, so I, I bless his memory and, and, his, um, and his fire, <laughs> his theological fire. Paolo was not an easy person to work with, um, meaning my first encounter with him, he mocked me in public. I, I was playing something at the piano. By the way, he fired his pianist and he says, no, I want to work with this guy. Like, which now I would go like, no. But at that time, you know, I was young. I said, okay, you know, I'll do it. Uh, but then he mocked me in public, like a very weird way. Wow. But later I understood what he was trying to do. <laughs> um, so Pablo is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a presence in my life that is constantly reminding me things about excellence and about, the importance of theological reflection as we do music, among many other things. Yeah. One of the things that really strikes me as you're talking about all this is the um, the, the way that you yourself think about mentorship uh, in the other direction. I mean, I, I hear I hear the stories of your, your being mentored, but I hear how they've influenced you as you uh, work with other people. And I wonder if you could say just like, because like that vision that you have or the dream uh, about your responsibility um it's just it's just striking to me um do you do you, th do you think about that very much i mean about mentoring others is that is that the question um yeah that's like the thing in this in this moment in my life uh i feel like an old man now um but one who has um received so much and um so i i see let me see how i frame that if there's an opportunity, for example, I, I used to do like a lot of big conferences. I try to not do too many now because it's like a lot of work. And also because I have a suspicion of how effective they may be or not, you know, like, like what's the payoff from them. But whenever I am asked to do one and I say yes, I always put as a condition um, that they need to pick somebody who will be mentored to do what, I, what, I, what I'm doing. So and if they cannot find somebody, I just say no, that's it, you know. Um, because, um, because I think that's the real work, um, the, you know, it's like, of course, it's great to enjoy a forest, but it's more powerful to make sure that seeds are planted so that the forest can continue to, you know, to, to grow and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't want, I'm not going to name names, but uh, they know who they are. And I want to tell them, if you're listening, um, that it's been the greatest privilege in my life to offer whatever level of mentorship that I've been able to offer. 
And sometimes it's only for a very brief season. I've had moments that have been just a conversation, sometimes at the Hymn Society. Um, and sometimes all it is is an encouragement, you know? Mm -hmm. And other times it's relationships that take like years. But all of them um, are, including the person who gifted me this shirt, by the way, um, a student from, from Uganda who um, I hold dearly in my heart. Um, so yes, that that piece, the, the mentoring of others, it's, it's so crucial. And it's a lot of what the hymn society is about, I think. Um, the hymn society was the place where, I mean, I remember my first meeting, I don't remember where it was, but I remember that I was like, oh my God, like, you know, I was talking to somebody and it turned out to be Brian Wren. <laughs> and I was like, and, if, and then somebody told me, oh yeah, I saw you talking to Brian Wren. He says like, what? You know, because he didn't, he didn't act it like Brian Wren. He practiced just like a member of the hymn society is talking to another member of the hymn society. Very few professional space. Although hymn society is professional, amateur, and but very few spaces in this world where that happens. It's it's a gift that the hymn society has that I believe to be very unique. Yes, indeed it is. Um, so you, you work um, at the uh, Board of Global Ministries. Uh, did, did, in, where, where did you go from there? Hmm. So um, Board of Global Ministries was oof, an amazing journey of 17 years. Um, oh. And um, on 2016, the board was um, moved, actually, to, to Atlanta, Georgia. And I was supposed to move with them. But... Um, the spirit, I believe, had other plans for me. So um, after almost very last minute, like my, my office had been moved, everything was in place, and I had sold my apartment in New York. And I felt a call to, to go back to, to local church work um, and to, to just to test that. Now, having said that, I, I was always in some local church work and actually had gone through uh, five years of being part of a team that planted a new church, which mm -hmm. an experience. If you have not had that experience, please have it. It's incredible. Uh, very tough, but life changing. So, um, the Church of the Village by um, in New York City, a United Methodist community, um, had asked me to substitute for two um, for for a few Sundays. Um, now. This was right before, um, those of you who are in United Methodist will remember the Portland General Conference. Um, and I was a, um, I was not a delegate to the conference, but I think it was part of the commission. I had to be there. Uh, and the General Conference is like a lot of stuff. We are moving also to Atlanta. You know, um, my apartment is sold. So it was not the perfect timing to, to help a, a local church. But when they came and asked for help, I said, well, you know, I'm leaving New York. Why don't I live with a gift to this place, this conference, this group of people who have blessed me so much? And I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, and it went well, you know, uh, many stories about that for another time. But then they said, could you help us create a job description for our next minister of music? And of course, that tempted me. I go like, yes, let's do that. I want to talk about the, what, what does it, and what does the world need right now? And in that process, um, together, we created a, a very different position, which I thought was what they needed, which was not a minister of music, but a minister of worship arts, meaning someone who would not just look at music, but would integrate all the other arts, preaching, um, all other spoken word arts, um, you know, the visual arts, dance, theater, and so on, and really bring them together, uh, bring all the talent that was there into a common vision and um, a hospitable environment. And then I left them with that job description because I was, you know, going to, I left, went to Portland, I was going to come back and then go and live in Atlanta. But while I'm in Portland, I, I, get, I get this call from the spirit that says, you know, you're not going to Atlanta. You're staying in New York. And I'm like, no. Um, so I I called um, I called Kim Long, um, another dear friend, who was sort of my backup in Atlanta. Like, if anything goes wrong with this move, she told me, actually, she said, I can get you a job at any time. So don't worry. Just come. Everything will be okay. And so I call her, and I go like, 
can, my spirit is like this. But before I can even put a word out, she says, Jorge, you call me always at the weirdest times. I just decided to retire from the seminary and I'm moving, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so this is not it. So I keep praying and something in me says, well, the treasure of the village people offered you a job. They said, you know, and, and you said, no, um, call them and see where, where that's at. And one thing leads to the other. I ended up taking the position that I had written the job description for. Um, and it's been an amazing ride, uh, you know, to, to do that work and to try to invent something new uh, in there. So that's, that's where I am. I'm at the Church of the Village in New York City. Well, I think that's fascinating because you, you've gone from work doing national, international work to doing local work, whereas, you know, a lot of people have gone in the opposite direction in their in their careers. So, and I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, the impact of that work that you've done before mm -hmm. that you bring into to that uh, local community. Yeah, good question. Thank you, Michael. Um, well, there was a severe pay cut, so I'm not going to lie about that. So I, you know, <laughs> I had to find other ways of making money and stuff like that. But God has been extremely good and gracious uh, with that. But the, let me see. For me, the greatest benefit has been to be able to let me see how I frame this: to test, to experiment in the real world potential approaches to very long-term maladies um, that, 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 are, that affect us in, in, in our church life and in our worship life. And to do so in a very supportive environment that the, a place where the first answer is, no, it cannot be done, but mm, how can we do it? You know, what's the mm -hmm. next step? Um, so the, in terms of what I, what I brought to, to it from other places, including the hymn society, I, I, I must say, um, it's it's hard to say because we are integrated selves. So I feel like I'm myself, like whatever I go, well, there I am. Um, but I would say that um, there was, um, there still is a cathedral instinct. And I hope this is not heard with um, as a prideful statement. Um, it's meant, you know, in the other direction. Meaning that we are, to do things not only for ourselves and or for our community, but to think of ourselves as all cathedrals used to think of themselves as places where something could happen that would benefit many other people. Um, so many of the approaches of things that we have done at Church of the Village um, uh, have helped other people who are facing similar things. And I just had the greatest joy just yesterday uh, a dear friend from the Hymn Society wrote to me and says, Jorge, I was going through a very low, this is not an advertisement, by the way, it's only a testimony. But the person said, I was going through a very low period, low time. And something in me says, you know, go online and, and, and watch, go to Church of the Village online. And then something changed within me, this friend says, and I just want to thank you for that blessing. So there's a way, particularly in this technological Zoom, everything is recorded way, which is a crazy, by the way, we, we must talk about that because there's a lot of issues around that. But <laughs> one, one of the beauties of it, it's that um, we can be cathedrals in that sense. So, you know, the, the repertoire of Joskan in this particular cathedral can move to somebody, to someone else in a cathedral in Brussels, let's, let's say. Um, so I think I brought that instinct from my work at Global Ministries. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. So, and now, now that you're, you know, deeply immersed in the local scene, and now that we're coming out of the pandemic, uh, sort of, um, I'm wondering what kind of challenges you're seeing uh, and what kind of issues you're facing in in your work. I think I'm going to start by naming the the latest, the one that is most present to me. Um, it's a difficult one to articulate, but goes like this: the difference between what we think is supposed to happen, what should be, hmm. and where the Holy Spirit is actually guiding and moving. So it's like like the difference between between having a map and watching a weather vane. The difference between those two. So in in our church now, I'm about you know as the minister of worship parts, I get to be the one to instigate conversations around worship. 
So we're about to have a conversation about online worship. Because my sense, with no judgment on anyone, is that we are caught in, but this is such a great thing, and it should be this way. And when it doesn't turn out to be what we expect it to be, we start, you know, um, at the first we start like nourishing the horse, but we end up beating the dead horse even, you know, just trying to make it work. And my, my posture is that whenever we are insisting on something longer than we must, that is keeping us from seeing what the spirit is actually doing somewhere else. You know, our brains do not have the capacity to, to be focused on this. And then also, it's like, so you have to be very careful. Um, so there was a period for Church of the Village where we grew online in huge ways. But now people are returning to their churches, which is awesome. And, and I could not be happier. Um, so it's a different moment. And the you know, church is not the nimblest of, um, of institutions. And there is so much of what we do that is shame driven. We must grow, you know, we must not just grow, but grow and be like perfect. And, you know, I'm working on this new, on this new theological construct that says that this is only a construct. So nobody, nobody get offended. Uh, um, the original sin, maybe, was the desire to not be human. You know, the serpent says uh, in the story, like, oh, so God told you that. Yeah, but because God knows that if you eat of this, you will be like God, having full knowledge of what's good and what's wrong and you know, good and evil. I, I don't read that as if they did not have a knowledge of good and evil. They had it already. But it, I read it more that they wanted absolute knowledge, mm -hmm. self-righteous knowledge of good and evil. And thus, the, it's an instinct of not being human. It's the Tower of Babel, again. And the incarnation of Jesus the Christ is God saying, no, the way is not the tree of knowledge. The way is not the Tower of Babel. The way is the manger and the cross. So the more that we embrace our full humanity, which then includes and must include the idea that we are in a journey that is imperfect. Um, and that, um, so, but, but there's so much shame built upon ministry at churches right now. I've always been there. As if, so I'm also working on this thought of what is righteousness. And I'm starting to understand that less as a state of perfection than a temporary state of something that is the right thing for that moment. There's this, uh, I was blessed with this wisdom. Um, I mean, I'm talking about wisdom. I'm still like in shock of the power of this wisdom um, in a workshop in Columbus, Ohio um, last weekend, I think. Someone quoted um, Bishop Shelby Spong saying, uh, upon being asked, um, how do you deal with the Nicene Creed, given that you have these critiques around it of, you know, it's, you know, its origins, its, its intentions, its theology, and so on and so forth. How do you recite it? Because you recite it. And he said, um, I'm quoting somebody who's quoting him, so I hope he said this. If not, should have said it, because it's a great statement. Um, the Nicene Creed, it's a love letter of people during a particular period of time to God. And I have no problems reading someone else's love letter and understanding it and loving it. Now, I will add to that to say, and I feel also responsible that we must keep writing love letters um, to God. Um, but so we, we both love these love letters and read them and sing them, you know. So every time that I'm asked to, to lead a hymn whose theology, I am not quite there at this moment in time. I try to go to the love that created that hymn and that sustains it. Um, often I do this when, I, when I, I used to work at Union Seminary with the, with the worship class. 
and I would trick students this way. On the on also mostly in the first session, I would say, okay, I want you to pick a song and write it down. The one song that you hate the most that is sung in churches, like the one that you think is the worst of all of them. And I knew what the usual suspects would be because it's we we have our similar complaints, you know. Yeah. And then I would give a lecture around all kinds of things, and then close to the end, I would talk about about this concept of of love, um, and and as part of as integral to ministry. Then I will ask them, okay, now I want you to take this song that you think it's so bad, and I want you to create a powerful worship moment with that song that does not deny your concerns with the song, but that starts from the place of how this song blesses the people who love it. And I, I want you to struggle with this for the next 15 minutes. And then we're gonna, and then you're gonna actually lead us in that song that you dislike so much. And I've had all kinds of reactions to that, but it's a good exercise. Uh, mm -hmm. And I do it myself. Um, sometimes I'm forced to do it because I'm asked to lead something and I'm like, oh, that <laughs> one. Um, but if you're asked, that means this is someone's love letter. Um, and at a minimum, you owe it to yourself and to the ecological universe to read the love that is there. Yeah, totally. So now that uh, you, your people are coming back to your church, um, how's the congregational singing uh, ministry? Oh. Well, thank you for bringing me back to topic because I, I went into a very big tangent there. But um, that was great. I no, I <laughs> love tangents. Um, yeah, it's um, it's a struggle, and it's a very a very present struggle. We, I think, we before the pandemic, we had just reached the sweet spot of becoming a real singing congregation. You know, like when people are really singing and it took a while to get there, but we were there. But then I think partly out of, um, I don't know, let me see. There, I, I will identify three things now that I think about it. One is, the obvious one is when you lose the practice of something, um, you know, we we are creatures of, of habit. Um, and when you start understanding an experience in a different way, um, where you are not singing together, it's hard to go back into that, even if you want it. There's something within, it's like the mechanisms are like, oh, 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 you know, the rusty and, 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 and there's a sense of even unfamiliarity and fear that comes over. So that's one, one piece. Um, Another one, which is the one that I'm struggling right now a lot with, is that when you are doing what people call hybrid, um, um, I don't know why I have a reaction to that word, but anyway, you know, online and on site, mm -hmm. it's very hard to be present in both places. So, and I have the, what would be the word, the um, disadvantage that... I communicate a lot through my playing. Like I can lead, I can lead a hymn from an organ from a piano pretty well. I think it is, I, I've had to develop those skills because sometimes it was just me, you know, and an instrument. But when you have that and you have a computer in front of you and then a congregation to this side and you have to be like speaking to both, it doesn't work. It doesn't, I mean, it's just the, the singing has gone, um, yeah, much, much worse than it, than it used to be. So. Um, but something happened a couple of Sundays ago, we were singing an offertory um, that had a very catchy refrain. And um, this was not meant for the congregation to sing it. It was not put in bold, you know, in the bulletin or anything like that, or there was no saying, now sing along with us. But people started singing <laughs> again. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I welled up and I, I, I could have just cried. Um, this is how important and how difficult this is. They started singing, just naturally singing. So that got me into more thinking and some of the things that I'm going to be doing. I started this Sunday, this past Sunday, but didn't quite get to where we needed to go. It's re, um, recovering a practice we had from before the pandemic where there was one member of the choir who was assigned a song as the main song leader. So that, you know, there's always a responsibility of an animator, you know, who's not me. 
um, because that person doesn't have to be with, you know, doesn't have to be on a computer um, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to more solutions um, to this, you know, tricky problem um, that we're facing um, right now. Um, but but I have to say it is a struggle, uh, and I sometimes I let my mm, wistfulness for the past keep me from looking at the weather vane of the present. Mm -hmm. And ask him the question. Okay, true. What's the spirit up to? Well, yeah. you know, what's so so? Yes, that's true. But so what? And now now what? What is what is the beauty that is right here that I'm not seeing? It does feel like we're at a transitional moment, doesn't it? Uh, that mm -hmm. you know we're we're coming out of a, a lot of isolation, and um, it's not entirely clear where we're where exactly we're going and uh, mm -hmm. how we how we can manage that. Michael, mentioning that reminded me of the third of the third piece, which is a theological piece. Mm -hmm. I and and I hope that this is no offense to anybody. I have deep respect to, for all understandings and for all moments in the journey because I've been at many moments in the journey and I've I wanted to receive that same respect. So I I, I offer it back. But from where I am now, um, which is hopefully not where I will be forever, I sense that we are at a long delayed theological crux that um, and that hymns and songs are part of that too so that let me see how I, how I frame this um, there's a moment where new content or renewed content needs new vehicles and we are so used to the same vehicles um, and same containers. And we don't realize that maybe plastic is killing us, which was helping us before uh, as a container for something. You know, for me, a song, a hymn is just a container of the possibility of an experience. It's not something in itself. Mm -hmm. It does, I could care less for it. I, what I care for is what, what it may allow to happen you know, the experience that it may welcome us into, which is always surprising. Um, but although they are um, that, they're also not innocent from meaning. You know, every cultural product has meaning um, mm. embedded. And that meaning is embedded by, yeah, by the main powers and main ways of thought that created it. And that's deep in its DNA. Um, I'm not saying it should not be engaged, but but we need to engage it not as an innocent bystander, um, you know, but as a very powerful rhetoric um, that needs to be engaged with wisdom uh, and with great care. So I feel very inadequate at this moment in time because um, the things that I've become very good at may not be the things that are most helpful for the future. So I'm in that journey. Sure. I mean, I think everything we do is, we, we talked about this before, is there's this provisionality to everything. Yes, yes. I love that word, Michael, provisionality. It's yeah. a holy It's a holy word. Yeah, it's <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it sort of helps us to keep our own perspective, you know, and, uh, and, and yeah. So, the, you uh, know, the hymn, the hymn Society is a perfect example of that. Why is it alive? It's because it chose to find the ways to respond. I mean, there was one moment where I thought, mm, this amazing place that has loved me and nourished me so much, it's about to die. <laughs> I, I honestly thought that, you know, because there was, you know, the renewing energy was not quite there. This is many, many years ago. So if you're new to the hymn society, do not listen to this part because just, en <laughs> just enjoy what others have created now. But there was a time when it was um, looking back into itself and into its glory, almost regurgitating. You know? uh -huh. But now, you know, after the efforts of many, many blessed people, I'm just, I'm going to also mention John Thunberg as one of them because I think he was extremely courageous, as was Jeffrey Moore. 
Nancy Faust. Is that all this amazing Andrew, you know, all these amazing presidents that we've had, including our president, when they have dared to, to go off script, let's put it that way. Yes. And we are blessed and alive because of it. But I remember when it was like super risky to do certain things, which now are like, yeah, of course, no problem. We can do that, <laughs> you know. But, you know, um, some, 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 someone had to have the courage to do it. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And, and I take it as an example for my own ministry. You know, Peter Raywalt just uh, put in the chat, uh, is it off script or holy improvisation? Oh, excellent. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Holy improvisation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, the, the idea of letting go, it's so hard to let go of something that we wish worked. <laughs> you know, right. the, the intention, of, nobody does, I don't think harm is done intentionally often. Um, it, it is done, but it's not the, the case most of the time um, when we're talking about this kind of work. But um, letting go even of our wish that something would work. Uh, because when it's not working, there's a moment when you have to say like, no, it's not working. Um, so Holy Spirit, what is, where, where, where is the weather rain pointing, you know, type of thing. Yeah, very risky, especially if you don't have plan B, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually worse when you have too many plans, I think, to be fully <laughs> honest, because plan B, sometimes it's just plan A forced. You know, it's like it's another way of bringing plan A. Um, uh -huh. So and some people have plan A, plan B, and plan C. And I, I think that's excellent. And it's a good practice as long as we do not engage this there's a line in a hymn i forgot the author but i this line guides me and it comes to me over and over god save us from the pride of our strivings god save us from the pride of our strivings not that we should not strive but that if we do it in a way that is prideful and self-righteous, going back to the knowledge of good and evil, like I know what's, what this congregation is. I know that this is like, no, you don't. No, you don't. You have some knowledge, you have some instinct, but there's a lot that you don't have. That's why we need the whole body of Christ. That's why life is an ecology. It's not just, that's why God is a trinity. Um, so it doesn't work. Um, I, I like to shock um, churches and, and start preaching these ways. It's like, I don't believe in Jesus. And then I complete the sentences outside of the Holy Trinity. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, like, I, you know, I actually would say like, I don't believe in the Holy Spirit outside of the Holy Trinity. Um, because um, that's part of the gift that we, that, that we have, that there's this mutual need. Um, nobody has the, the total knowledge, the total wisdom. We need to live it out, figure it out. What was the term that, that someone wrote? Um, um, holy improvisationize right. it. We need to holy yeah. impro improvisationize it. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about the whole, his side a number of times uh, uh, in, you know, over the past few minutes. And I was wondering if you took, talk a little bit about your own involvement in leadership. I know that you, you've been involved in leadership in Hymn Society. How, what's that been like for you? I am in debt, meaning what I have given to the Hymn Society is way smaller than what I have received. So I'm always in debt. I think I will always be in debt with the Hymn Society. The ways that I've been able to contribute uh, have been as you know serving in the in the executive. Um, um, I think Raquel <laughs> Martinez Mora was the one who like pushed me to go in there. Um, so thank you, Raquel, for that. Um, and oh my, I mean the the memories of that time um, are just so so blessed. Um, and the way that the group, you know, this executive committee made room for somebody who was actually quite different to most people in, in that room. Um, and the welcoming that I received, that's, that's unforgettable. And then I've, I've had the privilege of collaborating on, this is like the best part of his society. It's like collaborating like with Michael Horn on a hymn festival in Halifax. 
And 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 I remember telling Michael, Michael, I think I really want to leave this in, but this is way too hard. Uh, you know, and it was like, you can do it. We can pull it off. And we pulled it off, you know, it's like those kinds of things. Um, and also working like with Amanda Powell in, in Ohio. I remember moments of that. But that's a little bit of what I offer. But if I can put together all of the moments where my soul has been moved, transformed, shaped by being at him society in conversation, but mostly in him festivals, actually. Mm-hmm. It's like I remember Sally Morris um, in, in South Carolina, I think. And something shifted and changed in me that, that something changed me. I remember San Antonio. That something, so I, I, it's like in, in, in the Hebrew scriptures, people do like altars where they have met God. Many of these hymn society conferences, I have built like little altars. It's, Don't forget that this happened so that you are, this is, this is, this is part of who you are now. Um, so that, that is, that's just, just the, now the main thing that I think I've, I've contributed to the hymn society is inviting people. So I want to encourage everybody to invite people to the hymn society. Doesn't always take, but most of the time it does. Um, so I have my plans. Um, I brought my dear friend Katie Reimer to the hymn society at, in Washington, and I think she's completely sold now. Uh, so expect great things from her. Yeah. And um, and I'm about to 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 invite um, a couple of other friends to Montreal um, now because I think that's that's one way that I can contribute to the life of the society. I also signed up to be, was it a lifetime member or something yes. like that? Long time ago. I don't know how I did that because I was really not making a lot of money at the time. But I was like, I believe in this. I'm going to do it, you know. Um, and I just did it. Um, so, you know, the financial piece is also extremely important um, in, in all the ways that we can contribute. You know, it's funny you say that. I, I had the experience myself of being in, I think it was in Columbus or Anyway, they were celebrating the conclusion of the capital campaign, and John Thornburg stood up and gave this very inspiring talk at that luncheon, and I was so inspired that I went home and signed up to be a life member myself. Oh, good, exactly. So, exactly what you're saying. And Maybe, and maybe, one... maybe somebody's doing that right now as they hear you speak, <laughs> Michael. So. Well, you are sufficiently inspiring that I would not be surprised. Amen, amen. <laughs> So um, just one last question, and that is, uh, you know, what would be your fondest hope for the hymn society going forward? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> let me well, I didn't want to make it easy for you. Right? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, fondest hope. I think I'm going to name, I'm going to start by naming some things that we have transitioned well. And maybe that will bring me to what the next one is. Because I think I'm in, I'm in a celebratory mood right now. So that it's um, dampening my, um, my uh, gut wishes and my, my deep yearnings because I'm in, in a very grateful mood. Um, you know, I think in Hebrew society has transitioned very well. Um, I'm going to call the curse of mono, monostylism, monostylistic, the monostyl, monostylistic curse, you know? I think we've done that. Um, there's always more, more to do. I mean, there was one time where even doing like a praise and worship song in a hymn society was just like, oh my God, how dare you, you know? Like, and and I, just, I don't think we're in that place yet. Um, um, ah, that leads me to a growth point. Mm, yeah. I think that we are not yet as wise as we could be about the things that we like. Meaning, I believe that everything that I like has some poison in it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's poisonous. I'm saying it has some poison in it. I believe that nothing is pure. Like there's no like perfect this. Um, Colonialism is in every Victorian tune whether you, we like it or not. It's not our intention, but it is in it, whether we like it. That doesn't mean we should stop using them. That's not what I'm saying. But we need to become aware that there it is. Ah, there it is. Elitism 
it's in a lot of some of our most powerful and beautiful texts. I'm not saying we should not use them and keep it. Of course we should. And I could name a problem with every I mean, name. I actually did this in a class. I says, okay, let's just be playful. Name a song and I'll find the problem with it. You know, as, as this was my way of, of, of leaving the students, you have to be smart and, and understand that nothing is innocent from all kinds of hidden meanings that are within it. And then when you choose something, you're not choosing something else. So that kind of self-reflection without going into deprecation, um, I think it's something that we, where we could grow, you know, um, and, and become kind of wiser. The problem with it is that often when it's, when it's done, it's done in such a, a targeted and exaggerated way that it feels like a shame fest. Yes as opposed to an honest reflection on the limits of life and of, of expression. So, and, and then for whoever that is a beloved song, it becomes um, difficult uh, to, to stomach that their beloved song has some poison in it because all of them do, <laughs> sorry, but they all do. Sure. Um, you, know, you know, biblical texts have that same problem. You know, everything that is human has that little something in it also. So becoming wise to that without it becoming like a shame fest or a defensiveness fest, then, um, and I don't know how, how we can do that. I wish I had a, a, a thought. One of the ways that I do it in class is that I start by judging things from my own tradition. So I take like a Puerto Rican song and I go like, this is great. It does this very well. This is it. But it comes from this sort of understanding about God that is beautiful, but has its limits. Yes. And now we need, and now, so when you use it and you should use it, and please do understand that there is a particular vitamin that this is deficient on. So you need to supply it somehow, somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, getting that conversation going of the limits of, of what, of what of the, the things we engage without, again, falling into shaming, um, it, I think that could be a, a very good thing for us. That is an awesome point, and I think an awesome aspiration for us. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier about um, the process of theological reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be a ha habit that that if we are always reflecting on what we're doing, we're always going to see the flaws, uh, even as we embrace the good. You know, so well, very... the Apostle Paul will name it this way: you say something like. Uh, so as we look into the image of Christ, we are transformed from glory to glory to glory. Now, the part that the text doesn't say is that we, also, we, we see the image of Christ, yes, but we also see like our own image reflected and, and the things that need to be changing as, as we move along. We've been stuck, um, I think the churches, as, as the Christian church in general, has, you know, as I said earlier, it's, it's coming up for a very long delayed um, crux uh, because we've we've delayed, I think, our growth, not in our seminaries, but in in our local churches um, a lot, and that's painful, and beautiful, and necessary, and I think, like all things that God does, glorious, eventually, but it but like also like all things that God does, um, not necessarily completely pleasant throughout the whole time, but something that gives very good fruit. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I can't tell you what a joy it is to speak with you today and, and, um, and how inspiring it is to, to listen to your reflections. So I'm very grateful for you and for, um, for your part in this wonderful community that we have. Thank you. Of course, Michael, and thanks to everyone who uh, participated in this. I'm seeing such powerful, beautiful names there. And so uh, I will continue to rejoice at harvesting the joy of this conversation. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Thanks, everybody, for being with us today. Take care.